Hello, everybody. Hopefully you got my email. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? How's it going this morning? Oh, good. Thank you. That's good. All right. Hopefully, you all got my email. Sorry about that. I, I had a microphone issue just now, but I've, I've fixed it, I hope. So we're going to get started on, on test four material in, in a minute. All right, it's 10 a.m. Uh, we'll get started. Thank you again for your patience. I do appreciate it. All right, so we're going to we're going to get started on Lewis structures and VSEPR valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So I'm going to I'm going to give a brief reintroduction to Lewis structures, and we're going to and we're going to handle a couple more cases that we haven't dealt with before with regard to Lewis structures. So that one of the rules that we've, we've used in the past is that, and this, this rule still applies, is that we must use the exact number of valence electrons. So that's the first thing, no more, no less. And that, that doesn't change. But I'm going to introduce to you a couple of, well, and the other, the other thing, and this is, this is what's changeable, is that H needs two electrons and everything else needs eight. Now, this is what has underpinned all of the Lewis structures that we've done, but there are exceptions to number two, and we need to talk about these exceptions before we get into VSEPR. Number one still applies. There's no, no getting around that, but these are the exceptions for number two. Okay, so the exceptions are if uh, the central element is a metal, and uh, no, no double bond. Will form. Okay, so that's the first one. So we have done things where we have a central element that's not a metal and we've used double bonds in order to get an octet, but uh, metals actually don't need an octet when they're the central element, as it turns out. And the other thing is that if there are excess surveillance electrons,
after the outer elements have been satisfied. And I'm talking about the, the octet rule again. These electrons go on the central atom. All right, so I'm going to give you two examples here. First one is ALF3. Now this is an example of a situation that is electron deficient. So here's how we work it out. We do our balance electrons, which is going to be three plus three times seven, which is 24. Remember these numbers, the three and the seven come from the groupings on the periodic table. And aluminum's in group three and F is in group seven. So we go ahead and we do our Lewis structure as we normally would. And then we satisfy the outer elements by putting enough electron pairs to give them eight electrons and lo and behold we've used up 24 okay so we use 24 balanced electrons but because the central element is a metal we don't we don't do a double bond in order to make it give it an octet Elect, uh, L, uh, metals are by their very nature electron deficient and it's often the case that there'll be a vacant space on the, on the metal. And that vacant space is going to be ripe for the acceptance of electrons from other species. We call this a Lewis, Lewis acid type situation where it can be an electron acceptor. Now I know that we've dealt with other cases in the past where we have formed a double bond, but in those instances, the central element was not a metal, it was a non-metal. Yeah, so that's for that one. The other one that I wanted to deal with is this one, XEF4. F4. Now this might surprise some of you because you're thinking, hang on, XE, that's a, that's a noble gas. How can that form compounds? Well, it turns out that KR, XE and RN actually all do form compounds. They're, they're not incredibly stable compounds, but they do form them. The number of valence electrons we're dealing with in a case of XEF4 is as follows. It's going to be eight plus four times seven. Again, the XE is in group eight and the fluorine is in group seven. That is a total of um, 36. So what do we do? We take the XE and we satisfy the fluorines. So we do all that. Just like we did previously. So remember the these bonds that are used to bond to the central element contain two electrons. So that's XEF4, and that's a total of 32 that I've used up so far. That means that we need four more, and those four electrons will go on the XE. We usually put them on in pairs, of course. Yeah, so I know that's a bit, a bit unusual for you to see, but now you're seeing those two exceptions to the octet rule. The first is what I would call a situation of electron deficiency. The second case is when we have excess electrons, but that's how we handle them. Does anybody have any questions about Lewis structures from what you're seeing here? Any questions? So XE, it's gonna hold 
more than eight electrons? Yeah, yeah. And actually, in that instance, it's a total of, let's see, tw uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty extreme, isn't it? So there are exceptions to outside the eight octet rule, basically. Yeah, so no, but these are the two exceptions that I'm talking about. These are the only ones we really need to worry about. But in all instances, Roland, you'll notice that we do satisfy the octet rule for outer elements, you know, or the, the ones that are attached to the central element. It's uh, This is all in what we do with the extra electrons or deficient electrons when we're dealing with certain central elements, that's all. Gotcha. No, thank you. Okay. Anybody got any other questions? Okay. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to kind of make the assumption that you're okay with the Lewis structures, but when I do go through examples of this, we'll go through from the very beginning, and I'll show you how to get to Lewis structures first before we get into figuring out the, the VSEPR piece of the of the structure. But the Lewis structure is really the first port of call here. That's where we've got to go. So let's look at VSEPR and how we deal with it. So you'll notice that I'll, I'll go ahead and let me expand that a bit if I can. Here we go. This table gives you an idea of the kinds of, of molecular geometries we're expecting for different kinds of cases where we have a central element and then some combination of elements or non-bonding electron pairs. In the case of a situation where you've got AX2, that is A with two elements, you'll see that it's linear. What underpins all of this with the VSEPR is the notion that when things attach to a central element, they're going to want to be as far apart from each other as they possibly can be. So when you've got two things attached to a central element, what's going to happen is they're going to attach so that they're 180 degrees apart. You can also look at 120 degrees apart when you've got three elements. In that case, that's what we call trigonal planar. And again, this arrangement is going to be favoured when you've got three objects around a central element. The other thing that's important with VSEPR though is that a non-bonding electron pair takes up the same amount of space as an element does. So we treat a non-bonding electron pair as an object per se that attaches to the central element. As such, it takes up space and then will influence the shape of the molecule. So what you're going to see here is, and we're going to actually separate this out here. We have an overall shape that takes into account everything attached to the central element, both the elements and the non-bonding electron pairs. And we also have a situation where we just look at the elements and kind of hide, if you will, the electron pair. It's not that we're hiding it so much, we're just looking at what the shape of the atoms is on its own. So let me give you an example of that. In the first two cases we looked at, there were no non-bonding electron pairs to deal with. So we were just looking at straight elements. But if you look at, can you see my cursor here? Yes, we can. Good, thank you. At least I can. That's good. <laughs> Uh, then what you see seeing here are two elements and a non-bonding electron pair. Now the overall shape is trigonal planar because there are three objects specifically attached to A. So that's the overall shape of the molecule. That's important. It's going to be important for applications we show later on. However, if we were just to kind of, I'm just going to put the cursor above that non-bonding electron pair just to kind of hide it a bit. If we just then take into account what the atoms are doing, then what you're seeing there is just uh, a, a shape called angular or bent, if you will. But that's just taking into account the shape of the atoms. 
Now, it's not like the electron pair isn't still there. It is, and it is influencing the shape. But when you take it out and just look at the, the elements, the shape is just going to be bent. The reason... So, sorry, go on. Sorry. Um, for that one, I've always known it as bent. You'd rather us refer to that as... Oh, no, no, either way is fine, Emily. Okay. It's, it, both, both are completely okay. I, I, I say bent and angular. I use them. I use them interchangeably all the time. You can too. Okay, thank you. The reason that we make the distinction here is that we can, if you like, see, we can see the atoms, but we can't see the non-bonding electron pairs. The non-bonding electron pairs are somewhat invisible to us, but we can see the atoms. So that's why we make this distinction between an overall shape and then a shape that the atoms make. And we're required to be able to, to investigate that and look at that. So before we obviously can just determine, you know, an overall shape or a shape of the atoms, we need to make sure that we've got a correct Lewis dot structure. And that Lewis dot structure will tell us whether we have just elements or elements and non-bonding electron pairs as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, well, I'm not going to play the video here so much. I'm just going to, well, I'm going to play it a little bit. I'm not going to play the whole thing though. And what we're looking at here is this video called Overall Shapes, which I, I think is a, it's a really good video actually. The introduction to VSEPR is good. The overall shapes and the shape of the atoms, hybridization, dipoles. All of these are really good videos for you to watch and I would strongly recommend that you watch them at some point over the next couple of days if you haven't done so already. I'm hoping you've done so already because then you're, you're kind of ahead of the game here. All right, let's look at, uh, let's see, overall shapes. I know you're not going to be able to hear this because I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it uh, audible to you. All right, let's see. Now, what I do in this, and you, you'll, you'll see this in the video, is I, I turn the shapes around so you can see them. So this is an example where you've got three things attached to the central element. I'll, I'll move it back a little bit. This is two things attached to the central element. So that's linear. This is three things, and you can see that that's trigonal planar or a triangular is Trigonal, trigonal planar, trigonal is the other way of putting it. But that's where it comes from, like a triangle. This next one, this one's a little bit more difficult. This one is called tetrahedral. This is a three-dimensional structure. If you have four objects you want to put around a central element, this is the shape that the compound will take. Let's, let's see if we can... So a tetrahedron here is a four-sided figure that has four equilateral triangles as the faces. That's where the tetra comes into play. Plus the fact you, you've got four vertices here and the vertices are the, are the elements attached to the central element. Does anybody have any questions so far? And the reason they're like that is because it's they're opposite or they're, they're trying to stick away from each other, basically. Uh, right. I mean, that's the shape they're going to take on. I mean, if you had any four objects in space and you were trying to, to say, find it, figure out, well, where, where are they going to be so that they're furthest apart? This is the arrangement they're going to take on all of them. Gotcha. Now, likewise, if you've got five objects, Let's take a look at five. This is called trigonal bipyramidal. Now, the reason it's called that, let me see if I can play this a little bit. You can see, and you can see the, you see, the, and it's a combination of a linear shape. So you can see those two there and a trigonal planar shape. Now the bond angles here are 180 degrees between the ones that point opposite and 120 degrees between the ones that are in the plane. Does anybody have any questions? Let's 
So you can see here, I, I sort of flip it around, you can see the trigonal shape looking straight down the linear portion. And again, the reason that this takes on that shape is to have everything as far apart as possible. So you can see the bond angles in the planar part here are going to be 120 degrees. Does anybody have any questions? So there you go, that's what the trigonal bipyramidal looks like. It, the, the reason we call it that is because it's a triangular based pyramid and a triangular based pyramid and they're sort of both joined at the base. Does anybody have any questions? Do we have any questions? Oh, we have a we have a chat question here. Oh no. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, good. But again, you can watch this video on your own too, and I'd, I'd recommend it. It's a cool video. I nailed it. I really did. I think I did. Yeah. We'll have to hit that like and subscribe button. Oh, hit that like and subscribe button. <laughs> See, there's nothing. No, nobody likes it. Nobody's. No, no, no. But anyway, I shouldn't say that. People, some people are going to go in and unlike it if I'm not careful. So, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. It's, I, I think it's it's a good video. Only 400 views. I'd expect more people would have viewed this, but how? Oh, what can I do? If you've got six objects, then the shape is called octahedral. Now I know that sounds like a weird, a weird shape name, but it's a it's a shape that is, it's two square pyramids joined at their base, but two square pyramids joined at their base has eight faces. And that's where the octahedron comes into play. You'll notice that again, it's a combination of, well, it's basically a com combination of three linear, three linear structures or linear. And if you, if you will square planar. So there's a square, these are in the shape of a square I'll show you what that looks like. Yeah, I just want you to, to see me I just want to show you, there you go. So you see, when you look down, when you look down one of the bonds here, one of the linear portions, you can see that square shape of the other atoms. And again, there you know, six objects, this is the shape it's going to take on. So they're as far apart from each other as possible. And we're just dealing with 180 and 90 degree bond angles between everything. Does, uh, does everybody have any, does anybody have any questions? Not that I have any questions. Okay, so that's overall shapes. Now, if you're not dealing with any lone pairs, then the overall shape is the shape of the atoms. All right, so everything that we've, we've looked at here, no lone pairs, the overall shape is the shape of the atoms because we're not dealing with anything. But let's look at some examples now where we're dealing strictly with the shape of the atoms. And I cover that, I cover that in my Shape of the Atoms video, as you'll see here. Okay, so this is SO2. And when we draw the Lewis structure, it comes out with two atoms and this purple thing here is a non-bonding electron pair. The overall shape is trigonal planar because this does take up space, this non-bonding electron pair. But if we're just looking at the shape of the atoms, you can see that that is going to be what we call bent or angular. So 
So you can see, I actually show this in the video, but I just kind of um, have it not show the, the non-bonding electron pair. And you can see that that's how we, that's how we, that's how we do it. naming this is called angular. Now it's not like we've removed the lone pair, it's just that I'm not showing it in the diagram. So, All right, so has anybody had any questions about that? I really want you to be able to understand that distinction between an overall shape and just the shape of the atoms by itself. So this one, is for ammonia, NH3. And what that is, it's a nitrogen, and then it's got three hydrogens attached to it, and then a non-bonding electron pair on the top. It's just electrons. The only thing we can actually see are atoms. This is what we get. Now, the overall shape of that before we removed that electron pair was tetrahedral. Now, we remove the electron pair, and what we get is a shape that's called trigonal pyramidal. And the shape here is called a trigonal pyramidal, as you can see. It's a triangular-based pyramid where the vertices are simply the atoms, and the lone pair has been taken out, the, taken out of play here. It hasn't been removed per se, it's just been like covered up and because we, we can't see it. All we can see is the atoms. Does anybody have any questions? This example, I think is, uh, I think it's NH2 minus, but there are other Oh, H2O. No, it's H2O. That's fine. Yeah, it's H2O. That's what it is. Atoms and then two lone pairs. So you've got two hydrogen atoms, oxygen in the middle, and then two lone pairs. The overall shape of this is tetrahedral because there are four objects. And again, if we take off the lone pairs, what we're left with is a structure that is the bent. But you take off the lone pairs, and again, we're just left with a bent structure. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, they're only short videos, so so I, I think I think you should I think you should watch them. So th this is a summary of all the shapes that we tend to deal with for pretty much all the examples that we deal with, and you can see that for some of them with the lone pairs, uh, you, you're you're only seeing the shape or the molecular geometry, which is just the shape of the atoms. That's what we're looking at here. So the overall shape of this one here, the trigonal pyramidal, this one is going to be tetrahedral. The overall shape here is tetrahedral. You can see the, the overall shapes are on the side here. And then trigonal bipyramidal, trigonal bipyramidal, then octahedral, octahedral, octahedral. And then we've got the shape of the atom, seesaw, T-shaped, linear. And all of this is determined by how many atoms and how many lone pairs we have. Now, your next question might be, well, do you have, do you have to memorize these? Actually, actually no, because I'll, I'll show you, I actually give you, I actually give you something on the test that helps you with this. So you don't have to remember what the names of the shapes are, because that seems to be a real challenge for students. Uh, a lot of students are not real fond of geometry and they, they get caught up trying to remember the names of the shapes. So I actually give you the names of the shapes and then you um, then you should be able to, to figure out where to go from there. So it's not really so much about memory, it's about understanding what the electrons are doing. So let me, let me show you what, you, just, just so you can be a little bit reassured with what you have to know and what you don't have to know here.
I remember the test four is the same as what you get see on practice test four. So there won't be any real surprises here, I don't think. But if you look at what I give you in the test, I give you this here. I actually show you what the shapes are. Now I don't include the bond angles, but my argument would be, I think you can look at the shape and determine the bond angles fairly easily. A lot of people have trouble with that, but I think if you watch my videos, you'll have uh, an easier time of it, especially if you watch the one called overall shapes. So I, I do go through the bond angles in that. I don't know, I feel, I feel like you should be able to just look at the shapes and be able to determine the bond angles. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, so in the PowerPoint notes as well, I do go into bond angles as well. And I make this point here with this structure, what the bond angles are. And you'll notice I don't include an angle between the non-bonding electron pair and an element. And that's because bond angles are strictly between bonds between elements. And the thing is with the non-bonding electron pairs, we don't, we can't see them. So we can't really calculate a bond angle that, inso that involves them. Does anybody have any questions about what I mean by a bond angle? Okay. Well, let's look at the, let's see, I'll go back up here. Here we go. And you can see the, the bond angles are listed here in this as well. And you can see for linear, it's 180. For trigonal planar, it's 120. Trigonal planar, I want you to imagine a circle. A circle is 360 degrees. If you take a circle, you divide it by three. 360 divided by three is 120. So that's why we're expecting 120 degrees between each of these elements. Anybody got any questions about that one? The one that's a bit more difficult to understand is this tetrahedral one. The bond angles for that are 109.5 degrees. Now you've got to remember this is a, a three-dimensional object. And those are, those are three-dimensional angles that we're talking about there between the, the X's and the A there, the A, X, A, X kind of bond, a bond angle we're talking about there. As I had gone through earlier with the trigonal bipyramidal, those are 90 degrees, 120 degrees, 180. It's a 90 between the X's that are pointing up and the ones in the plane. It's 120 between the ones in the plane and 180 for the ones that are directly opposite each other in the structure. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. And for octahedral, they're all 90 degrees and 180 degrees. And I showed you that earlier. And again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of being able to visualize these shapes. And I think by watching the, the video, the overall shapes video, you get a, a really good impression of what these things look like and how to visualize them. And also then how to visualize the bond angles. Does anybody have any questions? Now the other the other thing we haven't we haven't discussed this before, and this is the notion of hybrid orbitals. Now this is going to sound really complicated, but it's actually not nearly as bad as perhaps it seems. And if anybody comes to me later and says, "Well, look, I don't understand this stuff about hybridization," I'm just going to point you back to this video that this, of this Zoom session that we're doing right now, because I'm going to go through and explain it. And this is the this is how this is how it's going to go down. Now, what we know is that if we talk about pure atomic orbitals, then we know what an s orbital looks like. It looks like a, a sphere. And remember what an orbital is. It's just a, a volume of space where we can expect to find a certain kind of electron. 
So for S electrons, they're in a sphere around the nucleus. The P electrons are in dumbbell shaped regions, volumes, that lie along each of the Cartesian axes in a three dimensional structure. So we're talking about the X, Y and Z axes in three dimensional space. So the, it's kind of like a, a figure eight, if you will. You'll also notice that there are different colors on each side. Those are called phases. It's not something we really have to worry about too much right now. We will worry about that more later when we get into molecular orbitals. So here is an example. This is carbon that we're looking at here. Carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, total of six electrons, six protons in carbon. If you look at the periodic chart, you'll see carbon is number six. It's got six protons. It's going to have six electrons. So it's got one, it's got two in the 1s, it's got two in the 2s, and then two in the 2p. Due to Hund's rule, we put the electrons in the 2p one at a time. Right? We talked about this at the last test as well. But when you're looking at carbon, your initial thought might be, well, there's only two unpaired electrons, so maybe you can only bond twice. Turns out, though, carbon actually does bond four times. Further, those bonds are all equal. I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all the same kind of bond. So how do, we, how do we explain that? Well, we explain that through the notion of hybridization. Now, you can't see this here because this is in, this is in black and white, but... In the color version of the slide, we have blue down the bottom here for the 2s orbital. You notice I've circled the 2s and 2p orbitals here. And then I've got these three here. These are yellow on the p orbitals. So when you take all this and you mix it together, you, and what I'm imagining that you're doing here is taking this glass of blue and three yellows, you end up with a big glass of green. And all of those are going to be equal energy. And these are all called sp3 hybrids. And I want you to think of a hybrid as just being exactly that, a joining together of a certain number of orbitals. So it's one s orbital and three p orbitals joined together. And each of these ends up being what we call an sp3 hybrid. So each one is basically 25% S, 75% P. It's a, it's a combination of S and P orbitals, what it is. Now, the, the way I like to describe this is, does anybody know what, what happens if you have vodka and then orange juice? So vodka down here and then orange juice. What do you get when you mix those together? Anybody know? Would it separate? Oh, wait, no, never mind. Now, does anybody know what you get when you, if you have vodka and three, one part vodka, three parts orange juice? Definitely a good old screwdriver. That's a screwdriver. That's exactly right. That's a screwdriver there. So that's what I want you to imagine that, that uh, a hybrid is. It's a mixture of those things. It's a mixture of vodka and orange juice, if you will. The vodka here being the S orbital, the, the orange juice being the P orbital. So we end up with the screwdriver here. And then we pour that screwdriver back into each of these. So each of these is equal parts vodka and orange juice. Well, you know, one part vodka, three parts orange juice are all the same. That's what I mean to say. So that's, that's what we get when we have an SP3. And we, we expect to see that when we've got four objects, when the overall shape is tetrahedral, we expect to see SP3. So I've got the, the possible combinations here that you're dealing with. And if you look at what the sp3 orbital looks like, you can see that it looks a whole lot more like a p orbital than it does an s orbital. I mean, it has some s character about it. You can see it's a bit fat up the top. That's kind of like the s part of it. And then the, the p part of it, you can see it does look a lot, does look pretty p-ish, if you will. But it's because it's 25% s, 75% p. So this does have an effect on the bond lengths as well. You'll find sp3s have longer bond lengths than say sp2s or sps. So sp3 is the combination of all of the orbitals here, the s and three of the p, so it's called sp3. 
when we combine only one, two, and three, that is one S and two Ps, we end up with three SP2 hybrids. And we only end up with as many hybrids as we have orbitals used to make those hybrids. So what I'm saying is if you start with an S and two Ps, you can only end up with three hybrids because you only have three orbitals. In the previous one, we had four orbitals to work with. So we end up with four hybrids. The other case is SP. And SP, we're only joining an S and a P together. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so let's see how that equates to what we were talking about before. So when we've got the total groups, and this is the overall shape that we're talking about here, linear, there's only two total groups and we need two hybrids because we've got two groups. That means we need a hybridization that's SP. So just we just need one S and one P and that you can see that we need one plus one is two, two hybrids. So we need an S and a P. So we know the hybridization is going to be SP for two. For trigonal, we need three. So that means three hybrids. So we need one S and two Ps. For tetrahedral, we need four. That means we've got an S and three Ps. Now things get a little bit different when we've got trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral. Because we are run out of orbitals with the SP3, then we've got to introduce another orbital in order to, to make up you know, the fifth hybrid or the sixth hybrid in the case of the octahedral. And you'll notice for trigonal, bipyramidal and octahedral, these are only really reserved for the bigger elements where access to the D orbital is actually possible. So for trigonal bipyramidals, SP3D, and for octahedral, SP3D2. You'll notice that the total orbitals in the hybrid always matches the number of objects in the overall shape. I'm hoping you can all see that pattern. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, I think that's a, it's a good place to leave it for today. I do apologize for the shortened lecture. We'll, in, we'll continue with the dipoles on, on Monday. I really want you all though, to spend some quality time looking over those videos if you haven't already done so. I think they're very useful and I think they'll go a long way to helping you with the concepts of overall shape and shape of the atoms, especially. And then also watch the videos that have to do with the the hybridization and the bond angles as well. All right, does anybody have any questions before we, before we wrap up for today? Okay, well, that's it for today then. I will um, I'll catch you all later. Thanks for have coming. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Ali, did you, did you need something? Candle?